The Power of Positive Thinking, A Practical Guide to Mastering the Problems of Everyday Living, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. Introduction, What This Book Can Do For You. This book is written to suggest techniques and to give examples which demonstrate that you do not need to be defeated by anything, that you can have peace of mind, improved health, and a never ceasing flow of energy. In short, that your life can be full of joy and satisfaction. Of this, I have no doubt at all, for I have watched countless persons learn and apply a system of simple procedures that has brought about the foregoing benefits in their lives. These assertions, which may appear extravagant, are based on bona fide demonstrations and actual human experience. Altogether, too many people are defeated by the everyday problems of life. They go struggling, perhaps even whining, through their days with a sense of dull resentment at what they consider the bad breaks life has given them. In a sense, there may be such a thing as the breaks in this life, but there is also a spirit and method by which we can control and even determine those breaks. It is a pity that people should let themselves be defeated by the problems, cares, and difficulties of human existence, and it is also quite unnecessary. In saying this, I certainly do not ignore or minimize the hardships and tragedies of the world. But neither do I allow them to dominate. You can permit obstacles to control your mind to the point where they are uppermost and thus become the dominating factors in your thought pattern by learning how to cast them from the mind by refusing to become mentally subvert, subservient to them and by channeling spiritual power through your thoughts you can rise above obstacles which ordinarily might defeat you. By methods I shall outline, obstacles are simply not permitted to destroy your happiness and well-being. You need be defeated only if you are willing to be. This book teaches you how to will not to be. The purpose of this book is a very direct and simple one. It makes no pretense to literary excellence, nor does it seek to demonstrate any unusual scholarship on my part. This is simply a practical, direct action, personal improvement manual. It is written with the sole objective of helping the reader achieve a happy, satisfying, and worthwhile life. I thoroughly and enthusiastically believe in certain demonstrated and effective principles which, when practiced, produce a victorious life. My aim is to set them forth in this volume in a logical, simple, and understandable manner so that the reader feeling a sense of need may learn a practical method by which he can build for himself, with God's help, the kind of life he deeply desires. If you read this book thoughtfully, carefully, absorbing its teachings, and if you will sincerely and persistently practice the principles and formulas set forth herein, you can experience an amazing improvement within yourself. By using the techniques outlined here, you can modify or change the circumstances in which you now live, assuming control over them rather than continuing to be directed by them. Your relations with other people will improve. You will become a more popular, esteemed, and well-liked individual. By mastering these principles, you will enjoy a delightful new sense of well-being. You may attain a degree of health not hitherto known by you and experience a new and keen pleasure in living. You will become a person of greater usefulness and will wield an expanded influence. How can I be so certain that the practice of these principles will produce such results? The answer is simply that for many years in the Marble Collegiate Church of New York City, we have taught a system of creative living based on spiritual techniques, carefully noting its operation in the lives of hundreds of people. It is no speculative series of extravagant assertions that I make 
for these principles have worked so efficiently over so long a period of time that they are now firmly established as documented and demonstrable truth. The system outline is a perfected and amazing method of successful living. In my writings, including several books, and my regular weekly newspaper column in nearly 100 dailies, in my national radio program over 17 years, in our, in our magazine guideposts, and in lectures of scores of cities, I have taught these same scientific yet simple principles of achievement, health, and happiness. Hundreds have read, listened, and practiced, and have, and, and the results are invariably the same. New life, new power, increased efficiency, greater happiness. Because so many have requested that these principles be put into book form, the better to be the better to be studied and practiced. I am publishing this new volume under the title The Power of Positive Thinking. I need not point out that the powerful principles contained herein are not my invention, but are given to us by the greatest teacher who ever lived and who still lives. This book teaches applied Christianity, a simple yet scientific system of practical techniques of successful living that works. Norman Vincent Peale Chapter 1. Believe in Yourself Believe in Yourself. Have faith in your abilities. Without a humble but reasonable confidence in your own powers, you cannot be successful or happy. But with sound self-confidence, you can succeed. A sense of inferiority and inadequacy interferes with the attainment of your hopes. But self-confidence leads to self-realization and, and successful achievement. Because of the importance of this mental attitude, this book will help you believe in yourself and release your inner powers. It is appalling to realize the number of pathetic people who are hampered and made miserable by the maladity popular, popularly called the inferiority complex. But you need not suffer from this trouble. When proper steps are taken, it can be overcome. You can develop creative faith in yourself, faith that is justified. After speaking to a convention of businessmen in a city auditorium, I was on the stage greeting people when a man approached me and with a peculiar intensity of manner asked, May I talk with you about a matter of desperate importance to me? I asked him to remain until the others had gone. Then we went backstage and sat down. I'm in this town to handle the most important business deal of my life, he explained. If I succeed, it means everything to me. If I fail, I'm done for. I suggested that he relax a little, that nothing was quite that final. If he succeeded, that was fine. If he did it, well, tomorrow was another day. I have a terrible disbelief in myself, he said dejectedly. I have no confidence. I just don't believe I can put it over. I'm very discouraged and depressed. In fact, he lamented, I'm just about sunk. Here I am, 40 years old. Why is it that all my life I have been tormented by inferiority feelings, by lack of confidence, by self-doubt? I listened to your speech tonight in which you talked about the power of positive thinking, and I want to ask how I can get some faith in myself. There are two steps to take, I replied. First, it is important to discover why you have these feelings of no power. That requires an analysis and will take time. We must approach the maladies of our emotional life as a physician probes to find something wrong physically. This cannot be done immediately, certainly not in our brief interview tonight, and it may require treatment to reach a permanent solution. But to pull you through this immediate problem, I shall give you a formula which will work if you use it. As you walk down the street tonight, I suggest that you repeat certain words which I shall give you. Say them over several times after you get into bed. When you awake tomorrow, repeat them three times before arising. On the way to your important appointment, say them three additional times. 
Do this with an attitude of faith, and you will receive sufficient strength and ability to deal with this problem. Later, if you, if you wish, we can go into an analysis of your basic problem. But whatever we come up with, following that study, the formula which I am now giving, giving to you, going now going to give to you can be a large factor in the eventual cure following is the affirmation which i gave him i can do all things through christ which strengthen me strengtheneth me philippians 4:13 he was unfamiliar with these words so i wrote them on a card and had him read them over 3 times aloud now follow that prescription and i'm sure things will come out all right he pulled himself he pulled himself up, stood quietly for a moment, then said with a considerable feeling, Okay, doctor, okay. I watched him square his shoulders and walk out into the night. He seemed a pathetic figure, and yet the way he carried himself as he disappeared showed that faith was already at work in his mind. Subsequently, he reported that this simple formula did wonders for him and added, It seems incredible that a few words from the Bible could do so much for a person. This man later had a study made of the reasons for his inferiority attitudes. They were cleared away by scientific counseling and by the application of religious faith. He was taught how to have faith, was given certain specific instructions to follow, these are given later in this chapter. Gradually, he attained a strong, steady, reasonable confidence. He never ceases to express amazement at the way in which things now flow toward rather than away from him. His personality has taken on a positive, not negative character, so that he no longer repels success, but on the contrary, draws it to him. He now has an authentic confidence in his own powers. These are various causes of inferiority, inferiority feelings, and not a few stem from childhood. <clears throat> An executive consulted me about a young man whom he wished to advance in his company, but, he explained, he cannot be trusted with important secret information, and I'm sorry, for otherwise I would make him my administrative assistant. He has all the other necessary qualifications, but he talks too much and without meaning to do so, divulges matters of a private and important nature. <clears throat> Upon analysis, I found that he talked too much, simply because of an inferiority feeling. To compensate for it, he succumbed to the temptation of parroting his knowledge. He associated with men who were rather well-to-do, all of whom had attended college, and belonged to a fraternity but this boy <clears throat> was reared in poverty had not been a college man or fraternity member thus he felt himself inferior to his associates in education and social background to build himself up with his associates and to an intent and to enhance his self-esteem his subconscious mind which always seeks to provide a compensatory compensatory mechanism supplied him with the means for raising his ego <clears throat> he was on the inside in the industry and accompanied his superior to conferences where he met outstanding men and listened to important private conversations he reported just enough of his inside information to cause his associates to regard him with admiration and envy this served to alleviate, to, ele to elevate his self-esteem and satisfy his desire for recognition. When the employer became aware of this, aware of the cause of this personality trait, being a kindly and understanding man, he pointed out to the young man the opportunities in business to which his abilities could lead him. He also described how his inferiority feelings caused his unreliability in confidential matters. This self-knowledge, together with the sincere practicing of the techniques of faith and prayer, made him a valuable asset to his company. His real powers were released.
I can perhaps illustrate the manner in which many youngsters acquire an inferiority complex through the use of personal reference. As a small boy, I was painfully thin. I had lots of energy, was on a track team, was healthy and hard as nails, but thin. And that bothered me because I didn't want to be thin. I wanted to be fat. I was called skinny, but I didn't want to be called skinny. I wanted to be called fat. I longed to be hard-boiled and tough and fat. I did everything to get fat. I drank cod liver oil, consumed vast numbers of milkshakes, ate thousands of chocolate chocolate sundaes and whipped cream and nuts, cakes and pies, innumerable, but they did not affect me in the slightest. I stayed thin and lay awake nights thinking and agonizing about it. I kept on trying to get heavy until I was about 30, when all of a sudden did I get heavy. I bulged at the seams. Then I became self-conscious because I was so fat, and I finally had to take off 40 pounds with equal agony to get myself down to a respectable size. In the second place, to conclude this personal analysis, which I give only because it may help others by showing how this malady works, I was a minister's son, and I was constantly reminded of the fact everybody else could do everything but if I did even the slightest little thing, ah, you are a preacher's son. So I didn't want to be a preacher's son, for preacher's sons are supposed to be nice and namely pap- pampy. I wanted to be a known. I wanted to be known as a hard-boiled fellow. Perhaps that is why preacher's sons get their reputation for being a little difficult, because they rebel against having to carry the banner of the church all the time. I vowed there was one thing I would never do, and that was to become a preacher. Also, I came of a family practically every member, member of, of which was a performer in public, a platform speaker, and that was the last thing I wanted to be. <clears throat> they used to make me get up in public to make speeches when it scared me to death, even filled me with terror. That was years ago, but the twinge of it comes to me every now. And then, when I walk onto a platform, I had to use every known device to develop confidence in what powers the good Lord gave me. I found the solution of this problem in the simple techniques of faith taught in the Bible. These principles are scientific and sound and can heal any personality of the pain of inferiority feelings. Their use can enable the sufferer to find and release the powers which have been inhibited by feeling of inadequacy. Such are some of the sources of the inferi- inferiority complex which erect power barriers in our personalities. It is some emotional violence done to us in childhood or the consequences of certain circumstances that something we did to ourselves. This malady arises out of the misty past and the dim recesses of our personalities. <coughs> Perhaps you had an older brother who was a brilliant student. He got A's in school, you made only C's, and you never heard the last of it. So you believe that you could never succeed in life as he could. He got A's and you got C's, so you reason that you were consigned to getting C's all your life. Apparently, you never realized that some of those who failed to get high grades in school have been the greatest successes outside of school. Just because somebody gets an A in college doesn't make him the greatest man in the United States because maybe his A's will stop when he gets his diploma and the fellow who got C's in school will go on later to get the real A's in life. The greatest secret for eliminating the inferiority complex, which is another term for deep and profound self-doubt, is to fill your mind to overflowing with faith. Develop a tremendous faith in God, and that will give you a humble yet soundly realistic faith in yourself. The acquiring of dynamic faith is accomplished by prayer, lots of prayer, by reading and mentally absorbing the Bible, and by practicing its faith techniques. In another chapter, I deal with specific formulas of prayer, but I want to point out here that the type of prayer that produces the quality of faith required to eliminate inferiority is of a particular nature. 
surface skimming, formalistic, and perfunctionary prayer is not sufficiently powerful. A wonderful colored woman, a cook in the home of friends of mine in Texas, was asked how she so completely mastered her troubles. She answered that ordinary problems could be met by ordinary prayers, but when but that when a big trouble comes along, you have to pray deep prayers. One of my many inspiring friends was the late Harlow B. Andrews of Syracuse, New York. One of the best businessmen and competent spiritual experts I ever knew. He said the trouble with most prayers is that they aren't big enough. To get anywhere with faith, he said, said he, Learn to pray big prayers. God will rate you according to the size of your prayers. Doubtless he was right, for the scriptures say, According to your faith, be it unto you. Matthew 9.29 So the bigger your problem, the bigger your prayer should be. Roland Hayes, the singer, quoted his grandfather to me, a man whose education was not equal to that of his grandson, but whose native wisdom was obviously sound. He said, The trouble with lots of prayers is they ain't got no suction. Drive your prayers deep into your doubts, fears, inferiorities. Pray deep, big prayers that have plenty of suction, and you will come up with powerful and vital faith. Go to a competent spiritual advisor and let him teach you how to have faith. The ability to possess and utilize faith and gain the release of powers is it provides our skills and like any sk any skills must be studied and practiced to gain perfection. At the conclusion of this chapter are listed 10 suggestions <clears throat> for overcoming your inferiority pattern and for developing faith. Practice these rules diligently and they will aid you in developing confidence in yourself by dissipating your feelings of inferiority, however deeply embedded. At this point, however, I wish to indicate that to build up feelings of self-confidence, the practice of suggesting confidence concepts to your mind is very effective. If your mind is, is obsessed by thoughts of insecurity and inadequacy, it is... Of course, due to the fact that such ideas have dominated your thinking over a long period of time. <clears throat> Another and more positive pattern of ideas must be given the mind, and that is accomplished by repetitive suggestion or confidence ideas. In the busy activities of daily existence, thought, disciplining, <clears throat> disciplining is required. If you are to re-educate the mind and make of it a power-producing plant, it is possible, even in the midst of your daily work, to drive confident thoughts into consciousness. Let me tell you about one man who did so by the use of a unique, a unique method. One icy winter morning, he called for me at a hotel in a midwestern city to take me about 35 miles to another town to fill a lecture engagement. <clears throat> we got into his car and started off at a rather high rate of speed on the slippery road. He was going a little faster than I thought reasonable and I reminded him that we had plenty of time and suggested that we take it easy. Don't let my driving warn you, he replied. I used to be filled with all kinds of insecurities myself, but I got over them. I was afraid of everything. I feared an automobile trip or an airplane, airplane flight. And if any of my family went away, I worried until they returned. I always went around with a feeling that something was going to happen and it made my life miserable. I was saturated with inferiority and lacked confidence. This state of mind reflected itself in my business and I wasn't doing very well. But I hit upon a wonderful plan which knocked all these insecurity feelings out of my mind and now I live <clears throat> now I live with a feeling of confidence, not only in myself but in life generally. This was the wonderful plan 
He pointed to two clips fastened on the instrument panel of the car just below the windshield and reached into the glove compartment, took out a pack of small cards. He selected one and slipped it beneath the clip. It read, If ye have faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Matthew 17.20 He removed that one, shuffled expertly throughout the cards with one hand as he drove, <coughs> selected another, and placed it under the clip. This one read, If God, if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31 I'm a traveling salesman, he explained, and I drive around all day calling on my customers. I have discovered that while a man drives, he thinks all kinds of thoughts. If his pattern of thought is negative, he will think many negative thoughts during the day, and that, of course, is bad for him. But that is the way I used to be. I used to drive around all day between calls, drinking fear and defeat thoughts. And incidentally, that is one reason my sales were down. But since I have been using these cards as I drive and committing the words to memory, I have learned to think differently. The old insecurities that used to haunt me are just about all gone. And instead of drinking fear, thoughts of defeat and ineffectiveness, I think thoughts of faith and courage. It is really wonderful the way this method has changed me. And it has helped in my business too. For how can one expect to make a sale if he drives up to a customer's place of business thinking he is not going to make a sale? This plan used by my friend is a very wise one. By filling his mind with affirmations of the present support and help of God, he had actually changed his thought processes. He put it into the dom domination of his long-held sense of insecurity. His potential powers were set free. We build up the feeling of insecurity or security by how we think. Filling our thoughts, we constantly fix attention upon sinister expectations of dire events that might happen. The result will be constantly to feel insecure. And what is even more serious is the tendency to create, by the power of thought, the very condition we fear. This salesman actually created positive results by vital thoughts of courage and confidence through the process of placing the cards before him in his car. His power is curiously inhi inhibited by a defeat psychology now flowed out of a personality in which creative attitudes had been stimulated. Lack of self-confidence apparently is one of the great problems besetting people today. <coughs> in, a universe, in a university, a survey was made of 600 students in psychology courses. The students were asked to state their most difficult personal problem 75% listed lack of confidence. It can safely be assumed that the same large proportion is true of the population generally. Everywhere you encounter people who are inwardly afraid, who shrink from life, who suffer from a deep sense of inadequacy and insecurity, who doubt their own powers, deep within themselves they mistrust their ability to meet responsibilities or to grasp opportunities. Always they are beset by the vague and sinister fear that something is not going to be quite right. They do not believe that they have it in them to be what they want to be, and so they try to make themselves content with something less than that of which they are capable. Thousands upon thousands go crawling through life on their hands and knees, defeated and afraid. And in most cases, such frustration of power is unnecessary. The blows of life... The accumulation of difficulties, the, the multiplication of problems tend to sap energy and leave you spent and discouraged. In such a condition, the true status of your power is often obscured, and a person yields to a discouragement that is not justified by the facts. It is vitally essential to reappraise your personality assets. When done in an attitude of reasonableness, this evaluation will convince you that you are less defeated than you think you are. For example, a man 52 years of age consulted me. He was in great despondency. 
he revealed utter despair. He said he was all, th all through. He informed me that everything he had built up over his lifetime had been swept away. Everything, I asked? Everything, he repeated. He was through, he re reiterated. I have nothing left at all. Everything is gone. There is no hope, and I am too old to start all over again. I have lost all faith. Naturally, I felt sympathetic toward him, but it was evident that his chief trouble was the fact that dark shadows of hopelessness had entered his mind of discolored, and discolored his outlook, distorting it. Behind his twisted thinking, his true powers had retreated, leaving him, leaving him without force. So, I said, suppose we take a piece of paper and write down the values you have left. There's no use, he sighed. I haven't a single thing left. I thought I told you that, I said. Let's just see anyway. Then he then asked, is your wife still with you? Why, yes, of course, and she is wonderful. We have been married for thirty years. She would never leave me, no matter how bad things are. All right, let us put that down. Your wife is still with you, and she will never leave you, no matter what happens. How about your children? Got any children? Yes, he replied. I have three, and they are certainly wonderful. I have been touched by the way they have come to me and said, Dad, we love you, and we'll stand by you. Well then, I said, that is number two. Three children who love you and who will stand by you. Got any friends, I asked? Yes, he said. I really have some fine friends. I must admit, they have been pretty decent. They have come around and said they would like to help me, but what can they do? They can't do anything. That is number three. You have some friends who would like to help you and who hold you in esteem. How about your integrity? Have you done anything wrong? My integrity is all right, he replied. I have always tried to do the right thing, and my conscience is clear. All right, I said. We will put that down as number four, integrity. How about your health? My health is all right, he answered. I have had very few sick days, and I guess I'm in pretty good shape physically. So let's put that down as number five, good physical health. How about the United States? Do you think it's still doing business? And is the land of opportunity? Yes, he said. It's the only country in the world I would want to live in. That is number six. You live in the United States, land of opportunity, and you are glad to be here. Then I asked, how about your religious faith? Do you believe in God and that God will help you? Yes, he said. I do not think I could have gotten through this at all if I hadn't had some help from God. Now, I said, Let's list the assets we have figured out. 1. A wonderful wife, married for 30 years. 2. Three devoted children who will stand by you. 3. Friends who will help you and who hold you in esteem. 4. Integrity. Nothing to be ashamed of. 5. Good physical health. 6. Live in the United States, the greatest country in the world. 7. Have religious faith. I shoved it across the table at him. Take a look at that. I guess you have quite a total of assets. I thought you told me everything had been swept away. He grinned ashamedly. I guess I didn't think of those things. I never thought of it that way. Perhaps things aren't so bad at all, he said pensively. Maybe I can start all over again if I can just get some confidence and if I can get the get the feel of some power within me. Well, he got it, and he did start all over again. But he did so only when he changed his viewpoint, his mental attitude. Faith swept away his doubts, and more than enough power to overcome all his difficulties emerged from within him. This incident in illustrates a profound truth, which is expressed in a very important statement made by the famous psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Menninger. He said, attitudes are more important than facts. That is worth repeating until, it tr until its truth grips you. Any fact facing us, however difficult, even seem seemingly hopeless, is not so important as our attitude toward that fact. 
how you think about a fact may defeat you before you ever do anything about it. You may permit a fact to overwhelm you mentally before you start to deal with it actually. On the other hand, a confident and optimistic thought pattern can modify or overcome the fact altogether. I know a man who is tremendous who is a tremendous asset to his organization, not because of any extraordinary ability, but because he invariably demonstrates a triumphant thought pattern. Perhaps his associates view a proposition pessimistically, so he employs what he calls the vacuum cleaner method. That is, by a series of questions he sucks the dust out of his associates' minds. He draws out their negative attitudes. Then, quietly, he suggests positive ideas concerning the proposition until a new set of attitudes gives them a new concept of the facts. They often comment upon how different facts appear when this man goes to work on them. It's the confidence attitude that makes the difference, nor does this rule out objectivity in an appraisal of facts. The inferiority complex victim sees all facts through discolored attitudes. The secret of correction is simply to gain a normal view, and that is always slanted on the positive side. So if you feel that you are defeated and have lost confidence in your ability to win, sit down, take a piece of paper, and make a list, not of the factors that are against you, but of those that are for you. If you or I or anybody else or anybody think constantly of the forces that seem to be against us, we will build them up into a power far beyond that which is justified. They will assume a formidable strength which they do not actually possess. But if, on the contrary, you mentally visualize and affirm and reaffirm your assets and keep your thoughts on them, emphasizing them to the fullest extent, you will rise out of any difficulty regardless of what it may be. Your inner powers will reassert themselves and, with the help of God, lift you from defeat to victory. One of the most powerful concepts, one which is a sure cure for lack of confidence, is the thought that God is actually with you and helping you. This is one of the simplest teachings in religion, namely that Almighty God will be your companion, will stand by you, help you, and see you through. No other idea is so powerful in developing self-confidence as this simple belief when practiced. To practice it, simply affirm, God is with me, God is helping me, God is guiding me. Spend several minutes each day visualizing his presence, then practice believing that affirmation. Go about your business on the assumption that what you have affirmed and visualized is true. Affirm it. Visualize it, believe it, and it will actualize itself. The release of power which this pr- procedure stimulates will astonish you. Feelings of confidence depend upon the type of thoughts that habitually occupy your mind. Think defeat and you are bound to feel defeated. But practice thinking confident thoughts, make it a dominating habit, and you will develop such a strong sense of c- capacity that regardless of what difficulties arise, you will be able to overcome them. Feelings of confidence actually induce increased strength. Basil King once said, Be bold, and mighty forces will come to your aid. Experience proves the truth of this. You will feel these mighty forces aiding you as your increasing faith reconditions your attitudes. Emerson declared a tremendous truth. They conquer who believe they can. And he added, do the thing you fear, and the death of fear is certain. Practice confidence and faith, and your fears and insecurities will soon have no power over you. Once when Stonewall Jackson planned a daring attack, one of his generals fearfully objected, saying, I am afraid of this, or I fear that. Putting his hand on his timorous subordinate's shoulder, Jackson said, General, never take counsel of your fears. The secret is to fill your mind with thoughts of faith, confidence, and security. 
this will force out or expel all thoughts of doubt, all lack of confidence. To one man who for a long time had been haunted by insecurities and fears, I suggested that he read through the Bible underlining in red pencil every statement it contains relative to courage and confidence. He also committed them to memory, in effect cramming his mind full of the healthiest, happiest, most powerful thoughts in the world. These dynamic thoughts changed him from cringing hopeless, hopelessness to a man of compelling force. The change, in him, the change in him in a few weeks was remarkable. From almost complete defeat, he became a confident and inspiring personality. He now radiates courage and magnetism. He regained confidence in himself and his own powers by a simple process of thought conditioning. To sum up, what can you do now to build your self-confidence? Following our 10 simple workable rules for overcoming inadequacy attitudes and learning to practice faith. Thousands have used these rules reporting successful results. Undertake this program and you too will build up confidence in your powers. You too will have new feeling of power. 1. Formulate and stamp indelibly in your mind a mental picture of yourself as succeeding. Hold this picture tenaciously. Never permit it to fade. Your mind will seek to develop this picture. Never think of yourself as failing. Never doubt the reality of the mental image. That is most dangerous, for the mind always tries to complete what it pictures. So always picture success, no matter how badly things seem to be going at the moment. 2. Whenever a negative thought concerning your personal powers come to mind, deliberately voice a positive thought to cancel it out. 3. Do not build up obstacles in your imagination. Depreciate every so-called obstacle. Min minimize them. Difficulties must be studied and, ef and efficiently dealt with to be eliminated, but they must be seen for only what they are. They must not be inflated by fear thoughts. 4. Do not be awestruck by other people and try to copy them. Nobody can be you as efficiently as you can. Remember also that most people, despite their confidence, appearance, and demeanor, are often as scared as you are and as doubtful of themselves. 5. Ten times a day, repeat these dynamic words. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31 Stop reading and repeat them now, slowly and confidently. 6. Get a competent counselor to help you understand why you do what you do. Learn the origin of your inferiority and self-doubt feelings, which often begin in childhood. Self-knowledge leads to a cure. 7. Ten times each day, practice the following affirmation, repeating it loud, repeating it out loud if possible. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 Repeat these words now. That magic statement is the most powerful antidote on earth to inferiority thoughts. 8. Make a true estimate of your ability, then raise it 10%. Do not become egotistical, but develop a wholesome self-respect. Believe in your own God-released powers. 9. Put yourself in God's hands. To do that, simply state, I am in God's hands. Then believe you are now release, receiving all the powers you need. Feel it flowing into you. Affirm that the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, 21. In the form of adequate power to meet life's demands. 10. Remind yourself that God is with you and nothing can defeat you. Believe that you now receive power from him.